Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Your Dose, the podcast where we speak to individuals with lived mental health experiences to help people feel less alone and more connected. And in this episode, we speak with Dana, who is going to share her experience with OCD, autism and dyspraxia. Dana discusses her crisis, diagnosis and the highs and lows of living with these conditions. She offers insights into neurodiversity, coping strategies, and the importance of self-care. Dana also talks about managing social media's impact on mental health and balancing her role as an influencer. Throughout the conversation, Dana emphasizes authenticity, shares her achievements, and highlights the positive impacts of neurodivergence. She provides valuable insights on workplace support, inclusivity, and her future advocacy plans. Dana encourages individuals facing neurodivergence to embrace themselves and establish boundaries. This is a really interesting conversation and touches on a few different topics that we haven't discussed yet throughout the podcast. I hope you enjoy it and thank you so much for listening. Dana, welcome to the Your Dose podcast. Thank you for being here. Hi. <laughs> how are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Um, not sure about these dark nights, to be honest. I feel like it's all of a sudden just winter. Yeah, I mean, before we hit record, we had to just suddenly go and try and find <laughs> a way to light up my face because... Yeah, yeah, literally. But the lighting's amazing now. You look great. <laughs> Whereabouts are you based, Dana? Um, So I live in Dorset, um, but I'm originally from Lancashire, so kind of a northern girl in the south. Nice. And do you like living in Dorset? Yeah, yeah, I do. It's, um, well, not today, but it's quite sunny, like as a place. So that's good. And it's close to the coast, which is a good grounding space. So Yeah. And do you live with friends on your own, parents? Yeah, so I live with my uh, fiance, uh, my oh, partner. Nice. Do yeah. you know why I missed that one out of all all of them as well? It's all right, it would be a partner. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and, that's fine. And um, just I always love to like learn a little bit more about the guests before we go into things. What is it that you're doing for work at the moment outside of what we will go into? Which obviously you know a bit of an influencer on TikTok and Instagram, but but what else mm-hmm. do you do? Um, So I work full time with a marketing agency called Purple Goat, which is an inclusive marketing agency. So uh, I work as a strategist and we work with brands to kind of build inclusion from the inside out and and get disabled representation into the mainstream. The whole idea is to kind of just make sure that when anybody sees an ad um, by by any brand, they can see themselves reflected in it. And um, we like to kind of build confidence with brands and bigger, bigger companies to make them engage with disability, but also be confident doing it. So that's really cool. And was that, yeah. did you apply for that job before you started your influencer world? Like, was this, or was this, did you maybe get headhunted for it? Uh, no. So basically what happened was I was an influencer first um, and then I worked with the agency as an influencer on a campaign. And then um, I saw a job that came up um, and I wasn't particularly like looking for a job. Like I was quite content in my activism and the other bits I was doing, but Purple Goat, like it was the agency that led me to it. So I, yeah, I applied for the role um, and it's been great. It's been a bit like a Hannah Montana moment because often like being on both sides of the spectrum, yeah. if that makes sense. like in the agency life recruiting influencers and and then then, also being an influencer yeah yeah I mean I really want to get into 
like the mental health side of it and this isn't so really I'm going off a little bit on, on a tangent with this but genuinely intrigued and being a little bit nosy but um what's it like being an influencer um it's great like in terms of like the like the community aspect so the community you build and kind of the connections you make is great I think when you're part of a marginalized group or and you put yourself out on social you get a lot more hate and the platforms don't necessarily do a lot to to protect or support marginalized groups on social media whether that be uh, LGBTQ plus or you know the black community black, black community like there's yes there's there is a massive gap in terms of support um, and being a disabled person. I make content that opens myself up to a lot of criticism from people that are uneducated or just want to be mean for the sake of being mean. And those people do exist. So it's kind of, it's great in terms of, like I said, the connectiveness of it. Um, But there is a wider conversation to be had around protecting marginalized creators on social because there isn't enough protection at the moment so it, initially I really struggled um with the hate comments because get thousands a day um but as time has gone on I well I've just learned ways of managing it which is basically not looking at my comments <laughs> yeah so I mean what, what else can you do realistically you're, you're a human being and it will get to you as much as um being an influencer and, and having all the amazing support and community and that feels amazing. It's still not going to take away from the fact that you're receiving hateful mm-hmm. comments. Um, yeah. And a lot of people will know who listen to this about what happened on, on my TikTok account. And it's such a shame. Mm-hmm. And I know that when I went to report people with a clearly very abusive comment, TikTok just ignored it and said it wasn't abuse. I'm like, how is that not an abusive comment? Mm-hmm. And they're st- they still then are, are then using their platform mm-hmm. to probably comment on more TikTok videos. Yeah, I mean TikTok abuse. in particular, it's like if you if they don't use a swear word, then it won't get flagged. Um, which is there's many ways to say hateful and discriminatory oh, things. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you for giving us a little bit of an insight on the influencer world. And yeah. <laughs> also highlighting the the bad side to it as well because that's often um misunderstood and I don't think people really see it for obviously it's it's an amazing it's an it's an amazing um lifestyle mm-hmm. but there is obviously huge downfalls as well but good on you for keep for keeping going and and keeping putting your voice out there which is what we want to talk about a little bit today so um could you give just a little bit of a brief overview of what exactly it is that you struggle with? Because mm-hmm. there's there's a few different things, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I would be kidding myself if I didn't say that, like, my disabilities and neurodiversities are linked to my mental health. Um, obviously, being autistic, autistic people are more likely to experience mental health conditions um, just as the way we're living and navigating in the world. Um, and a part of that, like kind of comorbidity, uh, is my OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, which is actually I was diagnosed first before autism, um, and actually oh, got diagnosed with autism through the OCD. Yeah. So, what were your what were you originally presenting? Like, what were they presenting symptoms, issues for you to be diagnosed diagnosed with OCD? And what sort of age were you at the time? So um, I think it hit a peak during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, But actually, looking back, I've had kind of traits of OCD or OCD presenting for a long time. Mm. But I wouldn't have even connected it to being OCD. But during the pandemic, I um, got a thought that I'd had before that was basically about thinking when I was a child, I'd kissed a friend and I got obsessed in my brain about whether it was consensual or not. So when I was like five, I like kissed my best friend and I kind of went into this whole rabbit hole of like asking her if that was okay. And she was like, yeah, like you're being silly, like kids do that. And I just, just went around in a loop. Like I couldn't, I couldn't let it go. I kept thinking that I was some kind of horrible person. Um, And I would like stare at pictures for hours trying to like 
remember it in full detail and it didn't matter how many times I went back to this friend who's still a really good friend to this day and said like oh my god was that consensual and she she'd be like we were five like don't worry about it like yeah um and it just went round and round in circles and then I kind of hit a crisis point Mm -hmm. um and I met my therapist Ian who I embarked on exposure response therapy with I obviously had other things as well, but that was the main driver for me to get the diagnosis and the support because it's what put me into crisis. So I worked with Ian and about halfway through the process, he was like, the way you're engaging with therapy for me presents as someone that is on the spectrum. Um, He was like, I'm not in a position to diagnose you, but I can put in a letter of referral. I got that letter of referral. um, And then there was a waiting list of five years Um, which I just couldn't cope with and Ian said like you know looking at your past history with mental health and kind of what you've been through like I would suggest that you need the diagnosis quicker Mm -hmm. Um, so I I paid privately which was very fortunate of what I was able to do and I and I got my diagnosis so um, yeah those those two kind of things have kind of interlinked really it took me being in crisis with OCD to get the diagnosis of being autistic interesting so the first question i have for you if you don't mind covering it is what exactly did crisis look like for you um so crisis looked like um oh there is my dog (laughs) sorry we love a dog on the podcast um crisis for me looked like using that i might have to take that squeaky toy off her in a minute but we'll see (laughs) Are we get I'm keeping this in, by the way. Okay, that's okay. You can hold that. Human, you know. <laughs> um, crisis for me uh, looked like waking up uh, with the the thought, same thought that I'd gone to sleep with, checking if it was still there. It kind of consu- being an all-consuming part mm. of just being in a constant state of anxiety and distress. Um, and using the crisis, honestly, using the crisis line a lot. Um, and I kind of felt, because I didn't know it was OCD at the time, I just convinced myself it wasn't mental health. It was just me being a terrible person, mm-hmm. being awful, having these intrusive thoughts and imagery um, that I just couldn't get rid of. And um, yeah, it kind of got to a point where I was messaging the crisis team um, that I had that was basically about ending my own life. Like if we're going to be candid here, uh, that's, that's what it led to. Um, so yeah. And then shortly after one particularly bad night, um, was when I was pushed through the system quite quickly to get some support. Thank you for sharing that by the way. Um, is this something that you'd had experience with before? Like, had you ever had, or was this just like a really random OCD, you know, theme that, or had it, when you look back, is that, mm-hmm. I don't know, you might know what there is, there's, no, there's an actual term for that sort of a OCD. It's something about, um, yeah, it's like memories. It's like where your memories try to trick you. It's memory. false memory OCD false or memory like, OCD. that's six. I've read into yeah, it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So had you had false memory OCD before? Was this just like the first time it ever happened? You know what? Actually, from reflecting in therapy, the same thought I had about this kiss with a friend, which I literally remember talking to everyone in my life at the time because I would look for reassurance everywhere. And they just Mm -hmm. thought I was crazy. They were like, you know, every kid kisses their friend. Um, But actually kind of what came out during therapy and kind of that response behavior was the whole reason that this had had the effect it had had on me. Because really, a, you know, a kiss with a, a girl when you were five really shouldn't bother you. Um, mm-hmm. I'd When I'd got older, I'd engaged in the church. And when I first started showing signs of OCD, uh, and I was kind of speaking about it, someone basically told me who was, at, who was in my church group that it was the devil. <laughs> so um, yeah. that made it stronger. Um, and, you know, although I had this this theme, I also had themes of religion in there as well about praying right. uh, and cancelling out bad thoughts by saying God. And like, I would literally be up all night being like, my brain would be like, you love the devil. And I would have to insert and be like, God, 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 like over and over again. Um, 
so that had actually been in my life for a long time like I'd lost a lot of sleepless nights about that but because I couldn't pinpoint what it was and it was being manipulated by the church group I was in to being a battle of faith uh, Mm -hmm. when actually it was just OCD um and there was no devil in my head um so Mm -hmm. yeah it had been there before um and in terms of like the, the, the that particular thought that triggered that kind of crisis moment, I'd actually realized that I had been, I'd had that thought before, but because I wasn't in like the depths of OCD, like I was able to rationalize it away. Right. Um, and obviously like OCD, like when you're in the clutches of it, it is not rational. It okay. is just like fear. It, it's, it's, it's a really weird state to explain to people because I have to constantly say like, it's not rational. Like my thing to do with numbers and even numbers, good and bad numbers, religion, all those kind of things. It's not rational, but it it causes that kind of emotional response and you can't lie to your OCD. It's just there. Like it knows what gets you when you think of something and it knows what doesn't. Mm. Um, So yeah, I think it had been presenting long before I was kind of in crisis. It was building like the cycle. Yeah, yeah. and. I mean, I have health anxiety, which is now sub, apparently a subtype of, of OCD. And mm. I can completely understand that rational side of it because it's only when you come out of it and you've stopped thinking about whatever it is that's irrational, you're like, that was so irrational. But mm-hmm. at the time, it feels so real. There's nothing that nobody, there's nothing that anybody can tell you to make you mm-hmm. believe that that is not true. And yeah it's almost when someone tells you it isn't true it only feeds it even more so you were probably getting the response from people with a reassurance seeking of oh yeah um no you were five why would that even matter but that's actually not the response that you're looking for and and that just then feeds into this cycle um so going back a little bit because you mentioned in therapy that your therapist at the time said that you were presenting as autistic Mm -hmm. what exactly were you doing in therapy that made him believe that um so I think there's a misconception around it well I'm gonna call it a misconception there's a kind of a cultural stereotype around autism that it's that autistic people think very linear 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 uh which is can be true but it can also like OCD is a core mobility mobility of uh autism um it can also be to our detriment. So like for me, um, I would, when he would try and kind of engage me in kind of that exposure response therapy, which for people who don't know, uh, is basically purposely putting yourself in that state, but not doing the compulsion. So you having to sit in the discomfort to basically teach your brain and your body that this is not something to be in flight or fight about um so it's very it can be very overwhelming and very scary and it's a lot of work like recovery for OCD is a lot of work and something that takes a lot of management but you know the reason that the autism kind of came up was he would say to me okay Dana like we've got your list of kind of your compulsions or your thought processes and now we're going to look to kind of deconstruct those and it would be things like you know I want you to put your mug down once um and just do it once and sit in that discomfort of it not being an even number and know that nothing bad's going to happen. And for me, I would be like, well, all the times that I've done it in the past, nothing bad has happened. And he couldn't let me to get let go of that. As in like tapping the mug, he doesn't know that it didn't work. Mm. And there was nothing even within the therapy that could make me shake from that. Um, And I suppose it was also a lot about a lot of the stuff that I was struggling with was actually rooted in social situations as well. It was about obsessing whether I'd done the right thing, said the right thing, or, you know, I'd often get like intrusive thoughts. Did I swear at that person? Was I rude? And I don't remember, or I don't know. It was this fear of like not knowing if I'd done something that I shouldn't have done, Mm -hmm. uh, which obviously we know with autism and kind of those social interactions. Um, so I think it was kind of in the themes, but then also how I engaged with the treatment that kind of alerted to him that I could be on the spectrum. Had you ever considered that you were autistic? Um, yes, 
I had actually, and that is because um, it runs in my family. Um, oh, I was just going to ask you that. Okay. Yeah, so that being one thing. Um, but secondly, obviously, because I had, I was diagnosed with other things first, like dyslexia and dyspraxia, um, I was already in the space. So I was seeing a lot of content. I was seeing a lot of content that was from the autistic community. And I'd be like, oh, that's that's me, especially around kind of um, how people who are assigned female at birth, how they kind of present a mask um I would identify a lot with and I kind of started to realize that maybe the image I had built up of autism in my head was only one way that autism could look yeah which I think is very similar to OCD if you don't Mm -hmm. know what it is you know like Mm -hmm. me and uh, Dana briefly just had a quick chat before we came on here and you mentioned the laying all the highlighters out and and it's and that's very much how OCD is presented on well not as much now on social media but but definitely that's what people oh you you've got ocd you must be so organized and yeah i mean it, it's so much more than that and i didn't realize i had a form of ocd mm-hmm. um which is why these conversations are obviously so important and obviously then you've assumed well like, there's no way i could have autism just because you've seen this one type that's typically the most spoken about but it mm-hmm. it's clearly a lot um what's the word more complex than just yeah. the way that you would perceive it mm-hmm. um in society so has autism affected your relationships in any way looking back throughout like childhood and stuff yeah i mean i think in particular probably friendships um mm-hmm. i've had a very turbulent turbulent life in terms of friendships and not knowing necessarily that someone's bullying me that's been an issue where I thought mm-hmm. someone's being my friend um mm-hmm. and it you know even with my mom going Dana this person shouldn't be hitting you if they're your friend um those kind of things like re- looking back reflectively and especially with my mom my mom's like oh that makes sense now um because you like didn't know even though I was telling you that this person was not your friend and not under- understanding, particularly in the complexity of females in in, t- in high school, kind of those group dynamics. I always wanted a one best friend, one friend, because one interaction is a lot easier to manage than a group dynamic. So, yeah, yeah definitely. And when so you were diagnosed with autism and OCD in 2019, No, so I was diagnosed with um, OCD and autism quite close together during the pandemic. So that must have been like 22. 22. Oh gosh, so not that long ago, really. No, it was dyslexia and dyspraxia that kind of was confirmed when I was 19. Um, That's when I started posting on TikTok. So on TikTok, I was making a lot of content first about dyslexia and dyspraxia. And then kind of on that journey, I went through kind of the OCD stuff and got diagnosed as autistic. So it's been, yeah, it's been not that long. And what made you start to go on TikTok and talk about dyslexia and dyspraxia? Um, Honestly, like most people, it happened kind of by accident. I kind of fell into it like head first. um, (laughs) There's my puppy. (laughs) Um, um mine seem to do that and I'm thinking in my mind be quiet please please <laughs> yeah someone's, I think my partner's just coming home so she'll probably chill in a minute but um what was your question sorry she distracted me don't worry um it was about the yeah about TikTok and, and why did you what made you start you said that you'd gone headfirst into you know talking about dyspraxia and dyslexia on TikTok Yeah, so I was doing my master's degree in uh, disability research. And at the time, I was focusing particularly on neurodiversity. Um, And just through that, because I was studying at home, that was all kind of wrapped up in the OCD crisis. Um, I actually also just to point out that a lot of people who, uh, you know, you see a lot of narratives on social media about people who kind of may not be able to function in terms of like in their home life or like in at school or at work. I had the opposite. So I became hyper fixated on my academic studies. I couldn't function anywhere else, but but I actually would 
end up studying way into the night because it was the only thing that I could use as a distraction. So I think um, it's also important to note that sometimes mental health can look like that too. Like crisis can look like. Really, impo- really important to point out. It is yeah. almost, um, it's very much in line with when you see videos of people who are depressed and there was a really good advert that they did. I don't know if it was Notts County Football Club. Anyway, Football Club did it. There's this amazing video of two men sat together at a football club, at a football game. And there was this one guy who looked really sad every single game. And the other guy was just really happy every single game, um, really good mood. And then just one day, the guy in the really good mood didn't turn up. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy who was always in the bad mood put a a scarf on his seat and he Mm -hmm. killed himself. Mm. And obviously it's, it's it's very easy to assume that just because someone's distressed or they're sad or whatever it is, Oh, they're not engaging in activity as normal that they are. They must have something wrong with them. And mm-hmm. if they're working really hard, well, how can you work really hard and be doing really well at school and also have mental illness? But yeah, basically what you were showing is like, I mean, I'm no psychologist, but it's almost like a compulsion, isn't it? To get away yeah. from like the the obsessive thoughts. It's a distraction. Like I remembered that just, in, just writing my thesis till 3 a.m. was something that I could, kind of like grab onto that was like oh anything but that anything but being alone with my thoughts so yeah no absolutely um so yeah I I came with came to it through my master's I was studying and as a part of my research journal that I had to like put together as a part of my submission I decided to start making like video skits and I posted one on uh on TikTok that was of a teacher that I'd had a memory of um and it did really well um and from there it kind of just snowballed and I started doing more and more and it just kind of kind of took on its own organic growth I grew very quickly and it was kind of very quick and like into the deep end um yeah and it wasn't long before I was kind of fully submerged in that space so wow something that I wanted to talk about I've never had this talk about this on my podcast before um it's dyspraxia Mm -hmm. I've I, uh, what exactly is dyspraxia and how what are the symptoms yeah so um dyspraxia is a really interesting one because it kind of sits in like the neurodiversity space um but it actually like as a scientific term it's a way of describing a cluster of symptoms um and it's it's basically a coordination disability or difficulty so it's where the connections in your brain uh, are either delayed or slowed down into doing something so kind of that kind of thought to body movement but it can also affect a lot of other things like the way your brain from brain to mouth to how you speak um your memory um and there's a lot of reasons why and how and no one's quite pinpointed as to why it occurs um so i was diagnosed with dyspraxia shortly after having meningitis during my developmental years as a child. Um, So we don't fully know if it's to do with that or if it's something that was always there. Uh, Research is very much ongoing and it's a conversation that will probably continue for a long time. Um, But yeah, uh, dyspraxia, or it used to be known as like developmental coordination disorder. Um, it's, It's kind of that mind to body movement is a very simple way of kind of explaining it but mind to anything basically is how I say so if I'm speaking if I'm trying to remember something it's kind of like like delayed process so so it's typically for you it's it's speaking um and memory or is there other things because I know that it's the people some people say oh I've, I've dropped something out my hand I've I think I'm just practical whatever it is so it's also the coordination balance side as well is that something that you struggle with yeah I would actually say the coordination side is probably that and the memory is probably the most significant thing for me so I hate to use this word because it's it doesn't quite adequately put together what the dyspraxia experience is but clumsiness or or like you know kind of pouring a a cup of tea but like missing the cup um Mm. or like memory like I'll put something in the oven forget that it's hot and go and grab the pan straight out things like that um so yeah yeah, I mean it looks different for everybody 
um, in terms of like how it presents. But yeah, for me, it's definitely the the coordination and then the memory is quite is something that I struggle with significantly. And how do you manage that on a daily basis? Well, I've kind of built a life that's quite accessible to me. So obviously I work from home. Um, PIP is another great thing that supports me. Um, personal independence payment, even though it's an absolute horrible process to go through. Um, it, it has kind of changed how I can like cook and feed myself and, and do these all these other things. Also, my partner does a lot of lot of things for me that kind of will support me in that. So it, it's one of those things I've never not had it. So it's kind of become instinctual but I think that transition into adulthood was quite difficult initially that kind of all the things you have to remember like every month without fail I'm forgetting to order my medication for my OCD like it's always like I've forgotten to order it I need it today but that it's just like inevitable to my makeup it doesn't matter what reminders I I set um so yeah it's kind of just an ever-evolving process to be honest of management different things so then asking you another question, because I know we've not really touched on this, and this is, we're obviously here to talk more about the mental health side of it, but because this is something that I haven't really discussed in the podcast, I do think it's worth just just touching on. Um, and I wanted to ask you this question anyway, because I don't think a lot of people will know about it, what it actually means. So you've mentioned, so you mentioned no, the word neurodivergent and neurodivergence yeah. a lot. Yeah. I know what it means, but can you explain to the listeners what that means? Because I think a lot of people would see that word and think, well, what's that? Yeah, so um, neurodiversity or neurodivergent is like a social term. So it's something that the community came up with for themselves. And it's basically, um, it holds like an umbrella of disabilities and conditions. And it kind of ranges from anything that's basically neurodivergence of the mind so it could be dyslexia dyspraxia uh it's also brain injuries um ocd yeah. mental health there's lots of sub pillars within the neurodiversity bracket um and diff- kind of different terminologies of how to speak about those different things but ultimately it's the neurodiversity of the mind or a, a difference in the brain thank you for that i think that was something that's worth mentioning on tiktok because it's the word is a, a lot on, uh, all over social media at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. I actually always thought that, not before today, but previously I thought that neurodivergent just meant, um, was like autism or mm-hmm. dyslexia. I didn't realise that it could actually just be anything that makes you think differently. differently. Yeah. 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 Um, so going back to OCD then, so you mentioned that you're on some medication just then. What else has been effective for you outside of obviously emo- um sorry emotional exposure response therapy which i know is amazing really hard work but amazing mm-hmm. um is there anything that you're doing in your day-to-day life that helps with ocd yeah so actually through access to work i have an app called brain in hand i don't know if you've heard of it I haven't but I'm definitely going to go and check it out after this podcast. You're intrigued. It's, you can get it through access to work. So even if you're self-employed or whatever you do, you can access this stuff. And, and it, it was an app designed to help people with mental health conditions and particularly those who are autistic um, to kind of manage the working or day-to-day life. Um, and it's, it's quite good because for a really long time, I was relying on platforms like Shout, or like Samaritans to kind of help during crisis moments, which would happen every couple of days. Um, And this app is a traffic light system. So I'm just showing you into the camera. So it's a traffic light system. So if I click Amber, it'll ask me every two hours how I'm feeling and you'll set up parameters for what it means for you for each kind of bracket. And if I hit Amber twice, like one after the other, then it will send an alert service to the crisis team who are in the app and they will call me or text me and will kind of either talk me through like a strategy that I have because obviously sometimes when you're in kind of that spiral, it's really hard to apply tools or whatever you've set up with people to kind of help yourself. So that has been a massive game changer. I've only had that for about a month, but that has been a game changer in terms of actually having access to that very quick crisis support because before love shout but 
it's an it's a it's a service that hasn't got fun a lot of funding and not a lot of volunteers so you can wait sometimes four hours for a response this app is 30 minutes maximum i actually i am actually a shout volunteer interested are you yes oh, awesome. i have been since um april time but yeah i mean it's um it's very understaffed yeah and um I mean, on a, on, a, on a Friday night or a, a Saturday night, it's it's ridiculous. As yeah. you can imagine, they're typically the times that people are most in crisis. Yeah. And they're typically the times when people are busy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's... um, I can, But that's amazing. That app is incredible. Um, I'll actually leave a link to that in the de- description so maybe some of the listeners can go and check it out because that's a really good idea. <laughs> um. Is there anything though from like a lifestyle perspective that you might do that helps? I mean, other than the fact that I've basically built a life that is from the comfort of my own home, I mean, I think I would be lying if I said that there was things that I could identify um, because it is something I kind of struggle with daily. um, And I do have bi-weekly therapy. So, I mean... I guess it also depends what's been set up in therapy that week or or kind of how we're going forward or what we're tackling. And honestly, like, it just depends on my emotional climate where I'm at. Some days I don't feel my OCD as strongly or really at all, other than things that are kind of, you know, and then other days it's very strong and it's kind of days where I'm having to really manage that anxiety. But I suppose you know kind of self-care behaviors audible is something that I use a lot um I listen to the twilight films over and over again um yeah. probably on like my 10th time going around the whole entire series now yeah I don't like listening to anything new that also could be autism but um yeah, yeah I find that really soothing <laughs> uh mainly because I also think Bella's well, it's neurodivergent it's so yeah so you have a partner, a fiance. Yeah. Yep. Partner, fiance. Um, it's all right. How? So, if there's anybody listening now who is who has maybe a friend or a partner or you know a daughter or whatever it is or a son that's that's maybe neurodivergent, um, specifically autism or OCD, mm-hmm. what is your advice for how they can best? care for that person as somebody who has a partner who is supporting you in that way um I think to understand what it looks like for them Mm. so obviously understanding the the disabilities in general doing research about what it is what it can look like but also kind of engaging with the person if you can to find out what their OCD like looks like what their triggers are uh, you know what what has happened in therapy that week so often like my partner for example knows not to give me reassurance because yeah. I can be quite manipulative about getting it uh it, you know it's a compulsion that is very strong of mine and mm. right from the get-go my therapist was like you know tell your partner that when you're asking these kind of questions you're looking for this reassurance and it can be very shrouded so but he understands that's nuanced to my OCD experience Mm-hmm. Um, so my advice would be to to figure out what it looks like for them and, and how you can support them in a way that makes sense. Yeah, amazing advice. And in terms of triggers, mm-hmm. I know it's hard, isn't it, to pinpoint. I'm still kind of trying to figure out what my triggers are. But mm-hmm. is there anything in specific? Is there anything specifically that would trigger um, OCD thoughts or, you know, some sort of crisis? Um, it used to be when I was kind of really quite unwell with it. I mean, something that I have to, I'm, I'm kind of like living my life now. I wasn't living when I was in crisis. I would say that any kind of crime show, uh, really? any kind of news, yeah, the news, uh, yeah, it was just, or any film about kind of the devil or anything that was right. the conjuring, any kind of advert like that would send me into absolute meltdown. Um, and also on social media, if I saw, because so I think so often on social media, you can randomly come across some really deep content that you would like, I would be scrolling and then all of a sudden it would be somebody's like, 
abuse story. And, you know, just to go back to what we were talking about before in terms of my OCD themes, the reason that they were so strong is because I am someone that has survived grooming. So like for me, it it's it's all very interlinked. Um wow. so yeah, and anything that kind of comes into my space that is not that I've got control over. Uh in now it looks a little bit more subtle, I think. Um my O C D can look of can look very it can build mm. over like a couple of days or or times. Someone can say something to me or I can get that thought when I come out of a meeting that's like, did I swear that person? Did I say that, yeah. Did I say that? Did I say something really offensive that I don't believe in? Um, mm. you know, I remember when I was doing a children's show, I was like acting in a children's show and I came out and I thought to myself, did I say a racial slur? which is not something that I would ever, you know, do or say or have ever even thought about, you know. Um, and I became obsessed that I'd said something in this speech that I said to the children that I'd said something racially offensive. Um, so it looks different, and I suppose it depends what's happening in my life, but kind of social media is a big one, which is ironic given my job. I was just about to say... I mean, one of my questions, which would probably follow on quite nicely from the question that I'll ask you now, based on what you just said, was around social media. Um, obviously, you're you're dealing with autism and OCD, um, plus having a full time job, plus <laughs> being an influencer and advocating as an influencer, um, and dealing with hate and everything else, and obviously all this potentially seeing something on social media which could affect you so I mean number one how do you deal with that from a work life balance perspective mm -hmm. and you know not not burning yourself out mm -hmm. um and how do you control what you see because you can you can you can only control so much right what you're seeing on social media so is there mm -hmm. any anything you have in place to not see those things that might trigger you Yes. So one of the main things is the social media that I actually engage with, particularly at night, because like a lot of people, that's my trigger point. That's my very vulnerable point, uh, is I will specifically search something to watch. So it'll be like satisfying videos, slime or like something like that. Um, I don't after a certain time, I don't just engage with like the TikTok algorithm because it's like mm. cowboy's land. You never know what you're yeah. going to get. I'm very specific about what I'll search, whether it's arts and crafts series or like scrapbooking. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, that's something that helps me. Um, and then in terms of kind of the wider conversation is I've taken all the pressure off myself in terms of social media. Like I am an influencer because it kind of comes with the fact I've worked with brands. But I'm also still disabled, neurodivergent and have mental health conditions. So I don't cross, I don't make posts 10 times a day or make stories about my life. Or, you know, if you're ever on my Instagram, I'm very intentional about what I post. I, I don't really post things that are in my everyday day to life because that would just be something else that I have to kind of manage and do. And I have fallen into the trap of trying to keep up with that. Uh, and that's something that's a surefire way to make me quite unwell quite quick. It's just mm. not the kind of content style that I like to do. Mine's my content style is chaotic with Karen impressions. That's me in a nutshell. It's not aesthetic put together yeah. posts that are beautifully curated and social media stories that are envy inducing. It It's just quite raw <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Which is amazing because then you know that the people that follow you are following you for Dana. Yeah. For everything that you are. Um, and, and they still support you rather than this false mm -hmm. image that you're trying to put across just to get, you know, more followers or mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, and I think that's really quite special because there's so many people who aren't don't use social media in the right way they perceive themselves as something that they're not and everything's about like how many likes can I get and you know I've focused on it so much especially with this podcast I was like maybe I need to change my content you know what's and, and you do fall into that trap but actually you have to do what feels right for you 
mm-hmm. and remember why you started this and you started your page because you it's your it's something you're passionate about you're interested in and you want to be an advocate for it mm-hmm. so and and I think the more that you try and go down the path of trying to be like everyone else is when when you fail because yeah. when you fail but it doesn't work because you're not being you mm-hmm. um and that falls in quite nicely to something that I found on your Instagram mm-hmm. and how I was having a little bit of a stalk that you actually um, this year were awarded the top 50 most influential divergent women. Is that right? Yes. yes. Incredible. Yes. That is Thanks. incredible. How did <laughs> that happen? Like what, what was the process? Um, so the process was I'd already seen um, – kind of it in the space um and it is one of those things like I kind of hate this part it's about awards where you do apply um so you know you kind of fill out the application and do all the kind of like what you've done for the community and is there anything in particular that you think that you know and I really wasn't expecting to get it if I'm totally honest because there's so many people and great people in the space um but I did so um uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell kind of applied and got it really um mm-hmm. and it's been it's it's a nice acknowledgement because there's not many awards that I can or do have the capacity to apply to. So it was one that perfectly fit what I was doing and what I wanted to do and kind of how I wanted to be, like be seen going forward. So other than that amazing award, mm-hmm. um, and something I don't think I've really asked before on my podcast is what are some of the positives that neurodivergence has brought to your life because obviously there's it's always very easy to look at the negatives but how has it shaped your life in potentially a more positive way um i mean obviously it's kind of given me an entire career (laughs) in terms of how it's led me uh like the activism it i definitely wouldn't have just like done this randomly it's completely come from lived experience um compassion I think I'd like to think I'm a very compassionate person and I'm always willing to learn about something new um Mm. and I think it's given me a certain level of um inquisitiveness Mm. in terms of understanding other people's experiences and their lived experiences of life and how it's kind of shaped and kind of also looking at the bigger picture because I'm somebody that from my master's knows that you know behind stats and statistics are real people um, and I think it's important that people connect those dots and understand like the cultural nuances that happen uh, mm. to, to someone's experience or, or how they've kind of ended up where they are. So, yeah, I mean, also the community, I think, uh, especially being on social media, it's given and being neurodivergent, it's given me an access to a network of incredible people um, that are doing great things. So, yeah. And have you made any friends directly through your community? Like oh yeah loads met in real life or is it yeah real? no loads yeah there's um so many creators that I kind of have come up in the space with like there's a creator called Ruby of my eye that's like her app and her name's Ruby and she's an autistic blogger um and I've become really good friends with them um there's a business owners as well um there's a, a neurodivergent led run business called Sokolo which I've done a lot of work with I did my planner with them um, and they make dyslexia friendly stationery. There's like so many people that I could say, and it's just a very supportive space in terms of kind of supporting what everybody's doing. Mm. So what's your planner? Huh? What's your planner? Oh, my planner. Um, yeah. So I designed a planner like, like it might have been a year and a half ago now, um, in collaboration with Chantel, who runs Soclo. Um, and it's a, a, a neurodivergent friendly planet. I'll send you the link afterwards. It's yeah, um, thank you, and I'll share it in the description so the listeners can have a look. Yeah, it's kind of all inclusive. So it's like got different. We kind of try. I try to think of everything, everything that somebody would need. It's also got a lot of kind of advice articles from me in it about applying for like access to work or personal independence payment. Just kind of trying to demystify like access to disability support. So cool. Thanks. And other than um, the planet and all this other cool stuff that you've done it, has there any other, been any other like specific achievements or milestones in your advocacy, your advocacy work related to 
neurodiversity? If... Any like breakthroughs at all? Um, I think reaching 100,000 followers on TikTok was quite a moment. That's amazing. How did yeah. that feel? To know there's 100,000 people yeah. who want to listen and, and watch your videos and, and you're having that. Because I, I think it's more than just that. It's the fact that you're having an impact. Mm-hmm. 100,000 people's lives that they that they want to you know listen and, and watch you which mm-hmm. is just yeah incredible. no it's it is it is it was that was an incredible moment I mean I think there's something about 100,000 as well that's quite mind-boggling uh in terms of like like they're people real people that are engaging with my content um in terms yeah. of other bits I mean, there has been a couple of ads that I've worked on that I've been like, I worked with the Hidden Disability Store, the Sunflower Lanyard Scheme, who I do a lot of work with now. Um, and that was quite, quite surreal. I mean, it's now weird because I'm like really close friends to them. So it's a bit different. But initially, I remember being like, wow, this is a system that I've used pretty much since I've been in crisis to manage my everyday life. And now they're actually responding to me to actually make wow. content with them. So that's quite insane. Um, and then also getting my job at Purple Goat, that that became possible through okay. the activism that I'd done and kind of how I'd built up that knowledge. Um, I'd oh. like to think there's something bigger coming in a year, but I can't say. Oh, well, I'll be watching the space. <laughs> yeah, I hate That's being that person. <laughs> um, you are that person, though. You can be that person now. <laughs> it's like a celebrity. Like, we're all just sat here waiting for you to announce the news. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, but something that I wanted to ask you, which I thought might be quite interesting, is around um, whether it be society or the workplace, whichever one you think would be, you know, more about in terms of discussing, how can either of those better support individuals with neurodivergence? Um, so in the workplace, uh, my advice is to hire Purple Goat to train your staff internally about disability and neurodiversity inclusion. It all starts with confidence and understanding your employees first and understanding what's available and demystifying that whole experience mm. process. So it would be to work with disabled people and neurodivergent people to build inclusion. If you've not got them in on the conversation, it's not going to work. Um, so that's my advice for workplaces. Um, and then in terms of society, um, it would be to understand quite similar to what I said about my about OCD is to understand the people in your life and and how it 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 kind of fits into the into them and how they experience it um because it will look different for everybody even people with the same disability condition neurodiversity it will look different um so kind of understanding and taking care of the people in your life um and then also just kind of educating and upskilling yourself about hidden disability in general and neurodiversity knowing that you know 80% of uh, disabilities are non-visible. So it, it it's a conversation more prominent than ever that, you know, if someone's sat in the priority seat on the bus, don't go and kind of interrogate them. Like their medical information has nothing to do with you. Um, mind your business, basically. <laughs> so. I really, I really loved that. I saw your, um, was it, it might have been TikTok, but it could have been Instagram. I think it was Instagram. And you did um, a really um, great reel about that exact thing. You were sat on a, you sat on, I don't know if you were actually sat on the bus or you were pretending to be sat on the bus. Um, <laughs> you know, you made it, you made it into a bit of a comedy sketch, which is amazing. So I love it when people do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, but it's, and you made a comment about, you know, why you sat there, but it's, but you, because you don't look like someone who's disabled instantly, yeah. or, but, but you just never know. Yeah, so that's really important to point out. Um, something on the tube in London, yeah. there's a priority seat for a reason. Like, and yeah. don't just don't sit in it unless, yeah. unless there's nobody on the tube at that time. Then there's some people are stood up, but if but just don't sit in there because yeah, you never know what someone might be going through, and that also goes the same for mental illness. Yeah, it, um, you can't always see whether someone is is mentally unwell. Yeah, absolutely. So just two more questions. So um, what are your, obviously you're, you're clearly working on 
something quite exciting. Um, but is there anything particular that you can share moving forward for you and and your advocacy work? Is there anything particular that you are looking to work on in the near future? Um, I think just continuing to make content around my lived experience um i would like to start making a little bit more content about pip and kind of that process um and kind of supporting people through that because it is really it's quite a difficult process to go through uh you know mm. it's not based on it's really silly but it's not based on if you've got a diagnosis it's based on how your disability affects you and for a lot of people that can be really difficult to identify because you live in your own life um so making content about that is something that I'm looking forward to um, and also just continuing to work with brands to kind of even if I'm not talking about disability like I'm not a lot of the time even having my voice in the in the space of like just inclusion in mainstream influencer marketing is great mm -hmm. um, I'd also like to be I'd like to go to more events but I say that and then can never go to them because I'm burnt out <laughs> but like, um, yeah. in an ideal world I'd like to see more disabled influencers in kind of mainstream events you know whether it's like boohoo or whatever it is I mean they're not sustainable yeah. but you know what I mean like mainstream yeah. kind of not just like disability focused campaigns because inclusion is when everybody sees themselves reflected in the content so yeah, yeah amazing um well I was actually gonna ask you another question but I'm actually just gonna ask you two sorry yeah. <laughs> um so Another question it just just come to me is around um, any specific like resources or books or organisations. Obviously, you mentioned the app. I've already forgot the name. I'm so bad with names. Right. Um, but it's okay because it's in here, and I'll ask you for the name of the app. Maybe you can mention it again. Um, that have specifically helped you mm -hmm. or continue to help you. Yes. So the Hidden Disability Store is one, or the Sunflower Lanyard Scheme. Um, you know, you can access those things before you're, you don't need a diagnosis or anything. And like, have, I've had endless conversations with people at the Sunflower about why they did it that way. And that's because you are something before you're diagnosed and supporting people in that period of their life is also super important. So don't be afraid to wear the Sunflower. It, it's just an indication that you might need more patience, time or support, and that's totally okay. Um, the I next thing in terms of resources would be other influencers. There's some great creators in the space. I mean, to name a few, Disabled Eliza, Ellie Mids, um, Ella Willis. There's quite a lot in terms of, you know, it, social media has been great for that. Like you can pretty much find what most of the things you want, but also being a conscious watcher of who you're engaging with, making sure making sure the perspectives are diverse and all those mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, you know, there's also a lot of community-based support in terms of, you know, obviously there's access to work, uh, but that's the government, but it's worth noting that access to work is something that you should, you know, you should absolutely be engaging with uh, if you can. Um, PIP is daunting, but PIP. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And also just utilising what's available to you. Um in terms of, you know, a lot of the time you're having to be your own advocate, even in medical spaces, um, and to kind of not lose hope in that process. So mm. I think I covered everything. I'm sure there's like so many more. Um, also finding charities specific to your disability or neurodiversity, I found super helpful. What is it about the charities that you find helpful? I mean, I think we've got to be careful when we're talking about charities because there is kind of a slight issue in terms of like charitable models with disability um but there are also some great charities doing work and i i suppose i'd like to i'd like to broaden what i mean by charities i also just mean anyone that's doing work in the kind of space of support um so this can look like like your podcast for example like engaging in things like that or just community spaces that are built for specific purposes or reasons and just bring the community together to have discussions even mm -hmm. if it's an influencer's comment section uh yeah. that's what i kind of mean i didn't quite mean charities in terms of like donate a fiver to save a disabled child that's yeah, not yeah. what i want to do you know like yeah, uh, yeah 
but you know also things like shout obviously i've just spoken a lot about it i use them a lot so or i did before this app yeah. um but okay. yeah that's everything <laughs> amazing well lots of resources there so thank you i love the sunflower one i've never heard of that before and i think that's such yeah. a lovely idea yeah well um, you can research it <laughs> yeah i will because you, you always hear about um children at school if they've maybe struggling with autism or something and teachers know if they're wearing a green top that they're not feeling good today <laughs> or whatever it is or you know if they're wearing a yellow top maybe they're that is a thing isn't it i don't know i've never heard of that but it sounds like it's something that would it's something amazing that, that happens so the fact that you've got the sunflower mm-hmm. to to represent somebody who's you know maybe maybe struggling a little bit from that perspective i think is is mm-hmm. really good so the final question um is if you could give one piece of advice to an individual who is listening who might be struggling with neuro neurodivergence specifically autism or um ocd dyslexia dyspraxia whatever it is that we've we've discussed today mm-hmm. what would that one piece of advice be uh it would be to take up space and i mean that in terms of like you know being vocal about what you need your boundaries um what you can do and what you can't do and knowing that it's okay it took me a really long time to realize that I could do that and um not just push myself to oblivion for other purposes or other things if you can't access something access something or it's gonna have a detrimental effect further down the line then flag it uh, you know we were talking when we came on the before we came on the call that this was actually meant to happen last week um, but I just wasn't in a capacity to do that. That for me is something that's setting a boundary or just, you know, taking up space, actually voicing yourself and being like, you know, I just can't do that today. And knowing that that's okay. And also if you're on the receiving end of that, being adaptable and approachable. Yeah, that is so important. And, I, you know, even as somebody who is this, does this past same stay or somebody who does this podcast who you know, I've often put this brave face on, you know, I struggle and, and it's important for me to, to be honest with my guests when I was said to you, look, I, I sometimes have to um, cancel on a podcast because I'm just not feeling up for it. And mm-hmm. in the past, I wouldn't have done that. And there's maybe been in the past where you wouldn't have done that. And mm-hmm. that's just negative uh, overall for your mental health. And it, and you, like you said, it, it wears you down and you end up burning out. So mm-hmm. I think that's really great advice but thank you so much Dana for being on here no. um you've shared some really great insights and spoken about things we've never spoken about before on the podcast <laughs> um you're doing incredible things in the space I'm excited to watch your Instagram I'm thank excited you. to hear about whatever it is that's coming up when, when will you be talking about whatever this exciting project it could be like 12 to 18 months it's going to be a little while (laughs) and right at the beginning of the process (laughs) okay well anyway I'm sure that some of the listeners will be will be watching along that journey with you as well but thank you so much so much for listening to the episode today i hope this episode has resonated with you and offered insights comfort and most importantly the knowledge that you are not alone remember your mental health journey is unique just like you are it's okay to have good days and bad days and it's okay to seek help and support when you need it you are strong resilient and capable of navigating life's challenges If you found value in today's episode, please consider subscribing to our channel and sharing this podcast with someone who might benefit from it. And if you'd like to hear more about specific topics or have any questions, please leave a comment below. We're here to support and empower each other. Together, we can break the stigma surrounding mental health and create a more compassionate and understanding world. If you haven't already, please do check out our Facebook community group, which is a non judgmental space for you guys to share your stories, experiences, and support each other. 
As we close the episode, please do remember to take a moment for some self-care, whether it's a deep breath, a walk in nature, or a simple act of kindness to yourself. Remember to nurture your mental well-being after these conversations. Thank you so much for being part of our community. Um, I appreciate you all so, so much. And also, if you are listening and feel like you could have a story to share, please do drop me a Instagram message, email me at info at vitamindose.co or or you can also go to the website and fill in a form at www.vitamindose.co. Thank you so much and I will see you next week.
Thank you so much for listening to the episode today. I hope this episode has resonated with you and offered insights, comfort, and most importantly, the knowledge that you are not alone. Remember, your mental health journey is unique, just like you are. It's okay to have good days and bad bad days, and it's okay to seek help and support when you need it. You are strong, resilient, and capable of navigating life's challenges. If you found value in today's episode, please consider subscribing to our channel and sharing this podcast with someone who might benefit from it. And if you'd like to hear more about specific topics or have any questions, please leave a comment below. We're here to support and empower each other. Together, we can break the stigma surrounding mental health and create a more compassionate and understanding world. If you haven't already, please do check out our Facebook community group, which is a non-judgmental space for you guys to share your stories, experiences and support each other. As we close the episode, please do remember to take a moment for some self-care, whether it's a deep breath, a walk in nature or a simple act of kindness to yourself. Remember to nurture your mental well-being after these conversations. Thank you so much for being part of our community. Um, I appreciate you all so, so much. And also, if you are listening and feel like you could have a story to share, please do drop me a Instagram message, email me at info at vitamindose.co or or you can also go to the website and fill in a form at www.vitamindose.co. Thank you so much and I will see you next week.